Hello everybody, my name is Evan Light, and as of July 1st, I will be an Assistant Professor of Communication at Glendon College, York University in Toronto. Many thanks to Tatiana and Ushi for inviting me to be with you, and I'm terribly sorry I can't be there in person. The title of my talk today is Undersea Cable Surveillance Extraction and the Future of Surveillance Activism. Today, I'll be giving a brief introduction to the panel, uh, looking at undersea cables, what has come up in the news over the last two years in terms of undersea cables and mass surveillance. We'll look a bit at submarine cable or undersea cable infrastructure, what's known as the GCHQ master list, which has come out of the Snowden documents. We'll look at some of the compromised cables, cables which have been compromised by the NSA or GCHQ. I'll touch on a couple potential links that these submarine cable companies um, have with extractive industries. And finally, we'll look at obstacles to surveillance reform and what we can learn from environmental movements. This will all be quite quick, a quick introduction to the longer panel. So to begin with, in August 2015, this past August, it, the New York Times broke a huge story detailing how AT&T helped the United States National Security Agency spy on the internet in general, um, a plan that goes back to the mid 80s, whereby the NSA had direct access to AT&T cables, AT&T networks across the world. A um, New York Times journalist investigating the Snowden documents noticed that a codenamed cable off the coast of a country in Southeast Asia had broken at a certain time period when one of AT&T's cables broke at that exact same point and realized that, oh, this codename is AT&T and was able to track back the collusion between these two groups, AT&T and the NSA, to 1985. Other stories in the recent news um, in the UK and in Germany there's been coverage of GCHQ's work with Vodafone's subsidiary Cable and Wireless. Cable and Wireless were an independent company until 2011 when they started to be broken up. <coughs> Vodafone acquired one of their units, Cable and Wireless Worldwide, which operated extensive fiber optic networks around the world, some of which land in the UK and have been documented as being really in the hands of the GCHQ, the Global Communications Headquarters in the UK, their version of the NSA. Channel 4 in 2014 did a wonderful 10 minute documentary um, looking in depth at how this works and conducting interviews with representatives of Vodafone. Definitely worth checking out. This is a map of the world's submarine cable um, infrastructure today from a company called Telegeography, which maintains a database on all current things, fiber optic and undersea. As you can see, it's a pretty extensive network crossing most of the world's oceans, connecting the, all the continents together with the exception of Antarctica. Today, there are 351 cables operating worldwide and 50 other planned cables. In 2009, GCHQ had access to at least 63 cables that were trans transiting through the UK. Today, in 2016, due to either mergers and acquisitions or the just retirement of these cables, there are today 48 cables that land in the UK that, according to the Snowden documents, um, GCHQ still has access to. Today as well, 64 cables land in the United States. So of these 351 around the world, a pretty huge portion land in the US or the UK and are thus subjected to mass surveillance by the NSA or GCHQ. A lot of this knowledge has come out of the GCHQ master list, a document revealed in the Snowden documents, um, a 56 page or so list of cables to which GCHQ had access to in 2009. Let me see here an example of one of these cables, uh, AC1, Atlantic Crossing 1. And we can see at the time it was owned by GX, which is Global Crossing. 
their code name for GCHQ was Pinage. In 2011, Global Crossing was bought by the company Level 3, who was a large American corporation involved in undersea cables and transit, but also a regular collaborator with GCHQ. I'll quickly touch here on some of the compromised cables. Cables can be compromised in a few different ways. First, through unauthorized access or tapping of the cables. Second, through direct collaboration with cable owners. In these cases, from the GCHQ master list, we can see that AT&T, Cable and Wireless, now Vodafone, Global Crossing, which has now been sucked into Level 3. Level 3, British Telecom, Verizon, Viatel, and Interroot have all been noted by GCSG as being collaborating um, partners. And then a third way is almost by an infection, I would say, where a number of cables are operated not by one company, but by consortiums. So by trusting a commercial partner, that is in turn collaborating with the NSA or GCSQ, a potential 81 companies could be affected by um, these, these various forms of collaboration between intelligence agencies and this set of um, cable providers, AT&T, cable and wireless, etc. To give you a quick summary of what this means, AT&T, I proven collaborator with the NSA going back to 1985, is the direct owner of 25 of these 351 cable systems around the world. They have 1.1 million fiber root miles of fiber in 182 countries, and they're the upstream provider for 71 Fortune 500 companies, including Walmart, Royal Dutch Shell, General Motors, General Electric, J.P. Morgan Chase, Siemens, Boeing, Dow Chemical, Lockheed Martin, Honeywell International, BAE, Northrop Grumman, and Raytheon. So AT&T is basically entrusted with the providing private access to telecommunications and to the internet by a number of weapons manufacturers, by banks, etc. Vodafone, in turn, in 2012, acquired cable and wireless worldwide. Today has over a million kilometers of undersea cables in 150 countries. They also have a 98% global satellite coverage. They're direct owners of 18 cable systems and have capacity on 80 ca other cable systems. And we're a partner in nine compromised cables on the GCSG master list. This is a map from AT&T, uh, AT&T's website documenting their wholesale fiber map. You can see it's quite extensive. And this is Vodafone's. Now, some work that I'm, I'll briefly mention, but that I'm not going to get into in this talk. I've been starting to see some interesting overlap between um, the members of boards of directors of telecoms that have been shown to collaborate with the NSA and GCHQ and with extractive resource companies, such as mining corporations, coal energy producers in the United States, petroleum producers, people who either are currently still involved at a very high level as members of the board of directors or CEOs of telecoms and of extractive resource companies, or pre have previously been in executive positions in extractive resource companies such as Royal Dutch Shell, and companies that typically were subject to a lot of public attention due to human rights abuses, but which continued to march on and really suffered no major repercussions. Today, a number of these individuals are in positions of power in telecoms that, despite the Snowden documents, despite revelations of mass surveillance and cooperation in mass surveillance, these companies really have seen no, um, no effect to their bottom line, no political pressure of some real palpable sort affecting the way they operate. Which brings me to some obstacles to surveillance reform. One of these is the human right to privacy. How, I think, in order to begin to engage in meaningful surveillance reform, we need to think about how you define the human right to privacy in an accessible way. How do you make this abstract thing something tangible, something people understand? One of the ways we need to do this is how do you, is to illustrate harm. How do you illustrate that surveillance is harmful? And how do you 
Thirdly, how do we make surveillance a political rather than a partisan issue? How do you make surveillance or the right to privacy something that is attractive to all political parties, something that is actually a human, a human right and can be, I guess, mobilized as such? And finally, I just want to quickly touch on a few things we can learn from environmental movements. One is different tactics. The environmental movements over the last 20, 30 years have engaged in a number of different tactics to fight their battles, be it shareholder activism, boycotts, and popular campaigns. They are very good at appealing to the broader good, defining their goal, their values, as something that is important for society and is not divisive. Thirdly, they're quite well practiced at making the abstract something real, something people can understand without thinking too hard. And finally, they're able to situate a specific sort of reform in a broader push for political reform. How do we take the problem of surveillance, the problem of violation of the human right to privacy, and make it a tool for in like, broadening democratic reform of political systems? That's all for today. Thank you very much, Tatiana and Ushi, again for inviting me. I'm really sorry I couldn't be here. Thank you to the panel. I'm hoping to meet all of you in the future. If you'd like to get in touch with me, please drop me a line. My email, evan at theotherthing.org. Thank you very much.